The more an RPG relies on background information to recontextualize its main stories, the less likely a casual player will find all the hidden connections. Characters can go on full appearances without the player actually knowing what the full context of their story is, and some subplots could have little to no buildup whatsoever because people are required to learn the lore. For example, most people just breeze through the Archon quests or the story quests to get to the main concurrent plot of Genshin. The Archon quests are meant to be the generalized and summarized representations of important lore elements. This is the purpose of a main story. Archives, books, and dialogues tend to require an extra level of work that not all players are dedicated or required to search, which is why they're called lore. The problem with Genshin's lore, however, is that it's very fragmented. It's mostly up to the reading comprehension of the players and how well you can make inferences based on your current knowledge. Watch my voice line analysis videos and you'll see characters contradict one another. Artifact lore is taken from a perspective where the person involved may or may not have a full understanding of a situation. Some events are straight up omitted. Interpretations in universe are subjective and inconclusive. Not to mention, Genshin lore isn't like standard RPG that just package a game story and that's it. Genshin's lore is constantly being updated, sometimes even monthly with events bringing the player into new experiences. The fundamentals of Genshin Impact's lore writing are confusing at best and straight up incomprehensible at worst. So today, I want to understand the structure of Genshin's lore and what makes its narrative so fragmented. Before I begin though, the goal of this video isn't to talk about the meta-narrative aspects of why Genshin's story is fragmented, but instead the lore within the lore. The somewhat in-universe reason for lore fragmentation. If we just go, oh Genshin lore is fragmented because it's for build-up intention, that's boring. The goal here is to examine how Genshin delivers its lore and why it becomes fragmented. So for that, I present to you today's theoretical framework. The narrative paradigm is a concept developed by Walter Fisher and is a communication theory that can be summed up in one sentence. People are storytellers. Each piece of information and knowledge in our lives are built from the experiences of others told to us through stories. Stories help people spread not only information, but also emotions, opinions, and other meaningful influences. Genshin's lore reflects these fundamentals very well. Lore isn't told to us like a textbook definition, but instead has a lot of flavor that allows us into the mind of whatever it's talking about. For example, the archive of the Crimson Witch of Embers isn't a completely third-person omnipotent structure, but instead takes us into the story of the Fatui and Signora, or rather, her delusion. It zones into Signora's story instead of saying something declarative. Even something that should be meta-narrative, like the character Miss Lenny, is told from the perspective of Dainsleaf. The character Miss Lenny is talking about their kits, but Dainsleaf also sprinkles in his own reflections of the character's past. We also learn about Dain through these videos, and he becomes an unreliable narrator. Artifact lore also carries this kind of thing. Storytelling instead of dictation. We are brought through history through emotion, not facts. The language is superlative, subjective, and feeling. The writing of artifact lore is third-person limited, usually meaning that if a character is involved, it's taken from their perspective and what they were feeling during the situation. Great examples of this are the Bloodstained Chivalry, the Pale Flame Set, the Maiden's Beloved, Crimson Witch of Flames, and the Thundering Fury. This also goes for books and world quests. This is what makes Genshin lore so difficult to piece together. These stories can still negate one another, bringing us fragmentation. So what happens is that I could give you a theory and show you evidence, but I could still be wrong because the evidence itself, in the grander concept of the game, was wrong. So what now? Well, according to the narrative paradigm, a story tends to be credible if it follows two principles, coherence and fidelity. Coherence refers to the structure of the story and its relationship with other stories. Does it hold well against other stories? On their own, the lore pieces in Genshin can be considered as questionable, but most likely if they follow a flow and justify each other, their events are generally correct. Coherence builds this mental representation of how likely this can even be true just based on the event you've seen in the game. A story can be coherent without being confirmed, interestingly enough. For example, the Cataclysm. The information we have about the Cataclysm supports each other. First, in the breeze amidst the forest, we have a piece of information that it was Albedo's master, Rhine Daughter, that began the Cataclysm because she sent her army to destroy Conria. This is supported with Durin fighting Barbados and A fighting against the Rifthounds from 1.0 and 2.5 respectively. Yes. 500 years ago, a great catastrophe befell Inazuma. Everything was engulfed in a pitch-black fog 
and monsters ravaged the land. Countless lives were lost, and this homeland that the people had worked so hard to build barely escaped being obliterated entirely. The monsters committed many atrocities on Inazuman soil, and the Rift Hounds were always their advance guard. Their duty was to tear open a passage through space with their claws and teeth, and then call in even more powerful beasts. The art of Kemia was also a big reason why the Cataclysm even happened, because that's how Rhyndaughter created the monsters that attacked the other places. We know this from two pieces of dialogue that support each other. Nain's apprehension about the art of Kemia in Albedo's video, and Venti's warning in his voice lines. But I know it well. It hails from Kanria, the art of Kemia. Soil and chalk, the universe and earth, pure dust and the birth of human life. There is no mistaking it. I am content to watch most crises play out from the sidelines. But if Albeda were ever to make a single wrong move, I could not let myself ignore it. How do you explain white chalk and black soil, or the Earth's dense crust amidst the emptiness of space? Same reason the purest soil gave birth to human life. It's an ancient power with unmistakable properties. Trying to harness it is dangerous indeed. I can't imagine what would happen if someone lost control of it in the city. <laughs> Never mind. What goes on within Mondstadt's walls is up to Mondstadt's people to deal with. <laughs> with the events of the Cataclysm itself, we get a firm picture of what happened based on the experiences of the characters. Our initial piece of lore about the Cataclysm is in the cutscene where Lumine is running away from the world breaking apart. It gives us a proper visual of what happened. Then we build that up with Dane's leaf story with the curse of immortality and the fact that the people of Conry were turned into the monsters of the abyss. Other materials also support these claims. The claim that the heavenly principles were the reason Conry fell was cemented by Piero's mocking mask and the pale flame artifact set. This was supported by A's dialogue in her Archon quest about the heavenly principles. But I've seen the nation strike forward and lose everything to the heavenly principles. Perhaps only if time stands still, will the lightning's glow never fade. The story of the Cataclysm, while somehow incomplete, is coherent. It has a solid structure as of now and it's safe to justify the current pieces of information we have because it's consistent. That's why we can theorize about the Cataclysm's occurrences without worrying about contradictions. Now, as an example of an incoherent story, we have the Visions, one of the most mysterious pieces of artifacts that have been here since the conception of the game. We have no idea what Visions are and what they do, and neither does Genshin's narrative. A great contradiction was where do Visions come from? By then, all the characters just had an idea that the Visions were from the Archons and were their sign of approval. But now, we know that the Archons don't even grant the Visions, just that the Archons know what their real purpose is. Only if the gods cast their gaze upon you will you receive a vision. Since my own vision was granted by the almighty Shogun, I shall return it to her in the end, without hesitation and with no regrets. Really? So in all this time, no new electro visions have appeared in the outside world? Well, what I can say on this topic is subject to certain constraints, but... It is not by my will that visions are granted or denied. The key is people's desire, and... Well... There's another side to it too. When an inconsistency is reached, it's almost impossible to properly theorize. Information becomes meddled and it becomes a matter of cherry-picking. Well, not necessarily. Because now we move on to fidelity. Fidelity refers to the reliability of the source, which is actually much more difficult to determine. I've mentioned that almost all of Genshin's story is written from a third person limited, meaning a character is usually saying or writing it. So we can boil down a story's fidelity with two criteria. Does the character telling the story have superior authority to that information? And is the character's emotions and personality meddling with the story they're presenting? Let's begin with authority. When we say authority, it's the credibility of a character's words based on their role in the story. Let's return to the Visions concept. 
We are most likely to believe the words of Zhongli, Venti, and A because they are archons, which means that they most likely have the most access to the truth of the situation. This also means that their word, in contrast to every other playable character, is probably gospel. For the sole reason that they're archons, they have precedence. It doesn't matter if the entirety of the Inazuma cast believe that the Archons are the one that gave the vision, which could create a more credible story given that there's more sources, A's voice line holds the most weight because she's the god, even though she's just one person. This may seem inconsequential now, but this is actually important for how we discern information in the future. We have more characters that have more important roles in the story than some characters. Some characters are just meant to be father, and some characters don't really have agency in the overall plot. In the end, the objective truth is in the hands of the few. The second one is the subjectivity of the character. Subjectivity will be used to refer to the emotions, personality, and biases a character can have when presenting a narrative. This is the biggest reason why Genshin's lore is so hard to dictate, because everyone tells their story a different way. Here's a small example. In the Pale Flame artifact set Surpassing Cup, it says that Scaramouche was thrown away like worthless dross, yet when you ask A about it, she said that she feels like she owes him something, and that she felt something when she discarded him because she did not kill him. It's those differences in bias that can change how a story is presented. The biases of a character can force them to change the story or manipulate the narrative. Tartalia's undying devotion to the Tsaritsa, painting her as a pitiful figure who had no choice but to fight the world. A's perception on eternity as being her only safeguard against pain when in reality it's hurting human progress. This is also the reason why lore from certain characters is difficult to fully accept. Venti and Dainsleaf are great examples of this. Their credibility is constantly tested because of their cryptic nature and motivations, meaning the degree that we can trust them is depending on the player. Hmm. Though I've long since viewed this scenery a great many times, there is something different about seeing it again with you. Surely you're not still concealing some other wondrous abilities. Hmm. Even if you were, it would simply further prove that my intuition is correct. The narrative paradigm is just a general framework for Genshin's fragmented story, but there are so many intricacies hidden away. Genshin's story, in my opinion, is just an interesting topic because it's so volatile. You can never be too sure about anything because everyone has something to say. I think this is why I even cover Genshin lore to begin with. It's much more unpredictable, and it's constantly evolving with time. The longer the story goes, we get to see new theories pop up, and new things get confirmed. It's pretty interesting. But yes, that's it for me. My name is Aster, and thank you for chilling with me.